yeah, we can probably open the doors wide open, Yasmin. Thank you. Great. I love seeing all the people come in the waiting room and I still look forward to the day we can do an event like this and I get the joy of hearing people walking into a room and talking right. with another. We'll get there. Although we wouldn't have this many people if we were doing it in person. It's so much more convenient for people to come together when we do things this way. Yeah, I think we're going to find a new, new balance, won't we? Yeah, I agree. I hope so. Welcome everyone. We see people coming into our Zoom room. We have a lot of folks registered for today's session. And so um, thanks for being patient. We'll give an extra minute or so just to get as many people in as we can before we get started. So thank you for your patience. And I see some familiar names in our attendee list. So welcome to some of our repeat webinar attendees. And then welcome to everyone who this is your first time coming to a work life session or a whole you educational event. We're delighted you're here. Especially since this might be one of the final hours of dry this week. You could be you could be outside taking a walk and here you are uh, building community and learning about something with all of us. Okay. Well, we have a great group of people in the room. We know some people will continue joining us, um, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of information to share. Uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Kathleen Farrell. I work in UW Human Resources and I direct the university's work life programs. And I am delighted to be hosting today's event um, in partnership with the whole U. And I'll say, I, I personally am especially excited about this event. Um, I can remember as a kid, like hearing my grandfather kind of whisper, oh, you know, be kind around her. She's going through the change. Uh, and then I can remember the first time mentors, you know, joked with me about, you know, wearing their blazer around their waist because they had had a messy day and saying, you know, gosh, I'm almost 50 and I'm dressing like a teenager all over again. You know, you wouldn't think that I've been a, a person having her period for her entire life. Um, and I've heard from many of you over the past couple of weeks about how grateful you are to come together and talk about um, this experience, which changes us on the inside and the outside, and certainly how we show up at our work and in our lives. And so thank you for being here um, for the session today. It is being recorded, and we will share the video on the Whole Use website uh, when, when it's available. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring them throughout, and our wonderful Presenter and expert will be answering questions at the end of our time together. Uh, whatever you put in the chat does not get posted to the web. That stays between the, among us. Um, and if you aren't comfortable putting something in the chat, you can chat me directly and I can ask a question on your behalf. So let's get started with today's event. Um, you know, our topic is perimenopause and we are incredibly, incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Susan Reed with us this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Reed holds a variety of positions in UW School of Medicine. She is vice chair for research, a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and adjunct appointment epidemiology. She is a board certified gynecologist she specializes in midlife women's health. How lucky for us. Um, and she strongly believes in a holistic approach to medicine. Most important, she loves engaging her patients as partners, um, helping them to improve their health and well being. And I think you'll discover, as I have, that she brings um, incredible compassion and humor and tremendous expertise to our topic. Um, she keeps herself healthy and well by doing pottery competing in triathlons, incredibly impressive, kayaking, hiking, listening to music, and of course, time with family. So Susan, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Fabulous, thank you so much, Kathleen. I'm really excited to be here together with this group. Uh, it's the, the webinar is a wonderful format because there are some uh, exciting ways that we can share through the chat that I think sometimes we miss in our um, 
in life experience. So I'm excited to, to have so many people present and uh, excited we're going to get started here. So I love this saying, I'm still hot. It just comes in flashes now. And I'm sure a number of you have uh, felt or experienced this. Let's see if I can. These are my disclosures. Uh, there are a number of things listed here. We hope to get into some discussions around uh, management. So I've listed those here in case we get there. But the task today really was to review for you all, what are what is what is menopause, menopause transition, perimenopause, and what is the post-menopause? What do all those uh, words mean? We're gonna review the symptoms and physiology of uh, the menopause transition and postmenopause, and talk about what uh, might be factors that would make you have uh, more bothersome symptoms. A review healthy lifestyle preventative health measures. And if you all would like, I've got a, a brief portion of the talk on menopause, or we can shift gears and go into some of the questions that we received. Um, on the pre-survey, many of them about management. So I'm, we'll kind of take a poll at that point probably. So to get started, uh, the, to ground our discussion around definitions, menopause is the date of the final menstrual period. We use that word in a bigger sense to usually talk about this time of life, of midlife, but it really is just a day and it's that final menstrual period. 95% of women will uh, undergo menopause between the ages of 45 and 55. And normal natural menopause can occur anytime from age 40 and above. If you have experienced a natural menopause at a younger age, that's not due to surgery or uh, chemotherapy or radiation, that is called premature ovarian insufficiency. And that's listed uh, here. Average age of menopause is 51.3 years in Caucasian women, and you'll see different ages for different uh, race groups. So I was tasked today to talk about perimenopause, but I really would like to uh, start with this definition of menopause transition, which is what we use as researchers because it is very finite and, and uh, that is the period of time when women have persistent irregular bleeding, plus symptoms prior to their final menstrual period, whereas menopause extends from the final menstrual year period through the next year. And so it's only uh, retrospectively that we can uh, define these periods and it, it gets a little challenging. For our discussion today, it's just easier to say the transition and the transition is that time that you've got irregular periods and you are experiencing symptoms. And then the postmenopausal period is that uh, that occurs after you've had that final menstrual period. Premenopause is the other term we use, and that is the period in your reproductive life when your periods tend to be irregular, be regular, and you're ovulating. An important sign that menopause will occur is within the next one to two years is over uh, greater than or 60 uh, days without bleeding. And this is uh, work that came out of uh, a group. I see Nancy Woods here on our, our Zoom. Um, I can't remember, Nancy, if you were part of uh, STRAW, but that was a there's, a, there's a huge body of research around this. Next, I wanna tell you a little bit about, cause there have been questions about why do symptoms vary so much from one woman to the next? And what do we know about that? So. Uh, there is a large study called Study of Women's Health Across the Nation, or SWAN, that looked at um, the, the transition into menopause and has been able to describe so much of what we know about uh, menopause. This slide shows that uh, what we learned from SWAN is that women who describe most bothersome symptoms falling after the menopause have a shorter median uh, uh, duration of hot flashes than those that experience symptoms starting in the pre or the perimenopausal uh, period of time. And this is, I can tell you clinically, this is the most common. The sad thing, and I, I think I'm hearing gasps through the mute, 11.8 years of symptoms 
is far more than any of your providers or clinicians are going to talk about. And it's not what we like to, to hear. It is a long transition. What do we know about race, Asian women, Japanese Asian women, a shorter duration of uh, hot flashes than African American women. So around five versus 10, almost double in our African American sisters, non-Hispanic women, shorter than Hispanic women. Women with a, a college or greater education have a shorter duration of uh, hot flashes than women with uh, less than a college education. If you are not stressed, you do a little bit better here as far as uh, what we might predict for the duration of your symptoms than someone who is feeling stress, so almost like nine versus 11 median years. Depression will lengthen your uh, duration of symptoms as will anxiety. We also know that financial strains being single versus married, a smoker versus a non-smoker, poor social support versus excellent support, and uh, with a BMI greater than 30 versus those uh, who are overweight in a normal range, all of these things are predictors of perhaps a longer uh, duration of hot flashes. Now, as we know, everybody's an individual. So you can take this um, information with a grain of salt and, and it may fit for you, but, but everybody is different. Every patient that sits before me is different. Now, unfortunately, what we've got going here was supposed to be a pop quiz. And in this view, I'm giving you all the answers and we aren't gonna be able to have uh, the pop quiz happening. So, um, I, I was gonna try to engage the audience and with our, our little glitch here, um, you all are gonna get spoon fed the answers uh, for all of this. But as I said before, median age of menopause is 51.3 and the best answer here is gonna be 50 to 54. And this is 7.5 uh, median years of duration for um, bothersome uh, hot flashes. What, you, what uh, we know is that Women experience symptoms for up to 10 years, but many of these are mild. And indeed, it's the bothersome symptoms that are seven to four years, and really around four years of moderate to severe symptoms that tend to cascade around the final menstrual period, which is here. So you see this nice bell-shaped curve, and the two years, uh, two to three years before, um, the uh, hot flashes is yellow and sleep problems is gray. They increase uh, closer to that final menstrual period and then they start to taper off. But sometimes women will say their worst symptoms are in that year following their final period. I wanna point out for those of you that have heard about the Women's Health Initiative, which was the largest randomized control trial ever done by NIH for women's health. The median age of these women was 63 to 64. And so when we are trying to understand uh, the best treatment for symptoms and risks, the age that you're having your worst symptoms were not the age, was not the age that was studied in WHI. WHI was a randomized controlled trial for prevention. It, it really was not designed to look at symptoms. So this is the next question. What are the most common symptoms that occur around the time of menopause? And, I, and I've listed a number of things here, but usually people don't choose menstrual irregularity. They think about that, but almost all women have menstrual irregularity. And this data would suggest 90%, but it would be very unusual to have totally regular clockwork periods and then have them just completely stop. And I know that 10% of women don't do that. So I, this 90% figure is definitely higher. Studies have shown us that women, some probably, and we, we have objective monitors that we put on people that will measure physiologic hot flashes, but women don't always feel them. So subjectively, 80% of women will report hot flashes and night sweats. Sleep problems is a big one that I see in my office. And most of my patients today will soldier ahead with their hot flashes and they are, we manage their irregularities with medications, but insomnia or sleep problems and feeling fatigue is a big problem. Well, we're gonna talk more about, about that. Mood changes and um, anxiety, depression are definitely increased. And we see this in women who have had 
uh, postpartum depression or who have had um, PMS or what's called PMDD, uh, premenstrual, perimenstrual um, dysphoric disorder. Cognitive changes, we used to argue about this as researchers, but we really know that during the perimenopause, there are changes in our ability to concentrate our verbal memory uh, and word finding. Musculoskeletal changes are often not recognized by your uh, primary care provider. Your body is chocked full of estrogen receptors and your joints and your muscles and your bones are all uh, loaded. And when your estrogen drops, we start to see uh, aches and pains, um, decreased muscle mass and decreased strength. Diminished libido is an interesting one because it tracks really well. Women having tons of night sweats do not feel sexy. So that's one uh, element uh, that speaks to this, but we also do have waning testosterone and a lot going on in our lives. So this is, uh, can be a big issue and we'll talk more about that as well. I did want to mention uh, the things that we think of that are truly postmenopausal, And as we all know, um, wrinkling skin is part of aging, but it does worsen with a decrease in estrogen. Weight gain is a part of aging, but it does uh, worsen with a decrease in estrogen. Approximately um, a weight gain of one pound per year in the postmenopausal period for usually around five years, so an average five pound weight gain, but it can go up to 10 years for some women. Vaginal dryness, um, very, very common. I said around 60% here, and that does lead to some pain with uh, uh, sexual activity. And as you can see here, only around 10% of women report ongoing bothersome uh, uh, hot flashes or night sweats. A lot of the skin, the vaginal dryness, um, these kind of problems are linked to our collagen, which is so um, estrogen dependent and have skin, eye, hair uh, changes that are, are uh, common. Um, just to give you a little more information about why do we have this heavy irregular bleeding? What's going on? Well, uh, first and foremost, you start to have menstrual cycles that you are no longer making an egg. So if you just look at this little flow diagram down here, this is day one of menstruation. This is day 14, day 28 of a classic menstrual cycle. And ovulation occurs right here in the middle. And what you can appreciate is with ovulation, when you make an egg, you make a nice boatload of progesterone here. And it's the progesterone that's so important to balance the lining of the uterus and to manage heavy bleeding. So in menstrual cycles where you don't make an egg and you don't make progesterone, you still have a rise in your estrogen and that feeds the endometrium, it's like food that the estrogen becomes really thick and fluffy, and then it becomes fragile and it breaks off at irregular times and you will bleed really heavy, heavily, causing flooding. And in some circumstances, hemorrhage, we see women in the emergency room requiring a transfusion because of the change in these cycles. So we usually think of menopause as a time of lower estrogen, right? But what happens first is Estrogen stays pretty solid. In fact, we see some nice high peaks here. It's like your ovary is trying so hard to make an egg and ovulate. It'll, you'll get some really high peaks, but you're just dropping out your progesterone and it's the balance there that's so important. So what are hot flashes? If you've never had one, um, I, some patients ask me that. It's a sensation of warmth that, uh, or sometimes even a skin irritation, a little bit of perspiration that tends to move, move from the trunk to the head. And some people will say it's like blowing my hat off. It's, it's just this hot, hot feeling. Sense of anxiety, heart palpitations, formications are, it's a medical term, kind of like little ants under the skin feeling like creepy crawly skin. Um, people that are more apt to have heart palpitations will have these, and it's a very common complaint in our Asian uh, cultures. The hot flashes can last from seconds to several minutes. Uh, they almost always begin before menopause. Uh, they occur because your blood vessels dilate and uh, you dissipate heat and you feel hot 
and you'll sweat. Interestingly, men will get hot flashes, um, particularly if given treatment for prostate cancer, hormonal treatments. And it was out of this uh, uh, a, attempt to help men who couldn't stand their hot flashes with their prostate cancers that we developed a number of our non-hormonal therapies that we use for women today. I just wanted to briefly mention uh, the candy. And so this is pronounced as capital K, capital M, capital DY. It's a kispeptin uh, neurokinin B dinorphin neuro, neuron complex in the brain, and we call it candy. Over the last decade or so, we've learned so much more about this part of our brain. It's a hypothalamus. And this is the gatekeeper or the regulator of the menopausal process. And it is what controls hot flashes. Very exciting new drug development coming uh, out that targets the candy neuron complex and will be essentially, uh, as best we can tell, not causing any of the side effects that hormone therapy does and will work as well, if perhaps even better than an estrogen pill. So this is uh, on our horizon and incredibly exciting. What about sleep? So uh, I'm uh, referencing here uh, our colleagues, Hayden Jaffe, Fiona Baker, who have done some wonderful work in their sleep labs where they hook women up with all their monitors. They monitor hot flashes. And what they've shown is that during this time in your life, you actually, women will say, you know, I was in bed 12 hours, but I feel exhausted. It's sleep awakenings. It's not total duration of sleep that's, that's uh, causing these disruptions usually. And that we, although we tend to wake up in an association with a, a night sweat or, or a flash, that these are not necessarily linked one-to-one. -one. And there's a different area in the brain that we see signaling or changing when there's an arousal or awakening. So, we think of uh, so much about menopause that it's all about estrogen and it's all about the hot flash. It really isn't. There's a lot more going on here than meets the eye, There's a lot of complexity. And it's exciting to be part of the research that's understanding this. Um, what about these musculoskeletal changes that I mentioned? Well, I already told you there, the body is full of estrogen receptors. Um, I would love to do a hand count, but a lot of you are blacked out there. How many people get frozen shoulders uh, during this time in your life? It's a common complaint. A frozen shoulder is such horrible pain that you literally cannot uh, move your shoulder and a lot of PT. There I see some hands going. It's miserable. And this is uh, why. Good news is, is that there are that we can manage this with some uh, great <clears throat> healthcare providers. But it, it, it is part of the reality of your menopause transition. You have an increased risk for fractures, especially if you're a, a small Caucasian woman, uh, or perhaps if you have, have other risk factors for fracture. Women who take estrogen are less apt to have hip replacements um, or knee replacements. So we know that estrogen in some circumstances can be beneficial. And all of us who have gone through menopause struggle with diminished muscle mass. I, I'm here feeling my hands. Opening a jar uh, can be challenging because we lose strength. And there's so many things we need to do to stay ahead of this. And then lastly, we think of musculoskeletal change. Muscle mass is related to testosterone in men and women. And what you see here, here we are at 50 years. There's not a huge dip or falling off the cliff here per se, but oh, to be 20 years again, old again, you know, look at this trajectory, it's, it's not pretty. All right, um, mood cognition and sexual function, so important to have these discussions because some providers don't recognize that your, the changes that are occurring during the menopause transition really are physiologic changes in your brain that will result in a mood change, will result in your abilities to concentrate, word finding, how many of you uh, stepped up to introduce someone you know really well and somehow their name jumped out of your brain. So embarrassing, right? 
and, and we have all uh, figured out ways to adapt to get ourselves out of those uh, situations. Processing speed. So the name comes to you, but it's far after the, the moment when you needed to introduce that person. Some of this is aging um, and teasing that apart can be challenging, but certainly um, what's happening to you physiologically at, at the time of menopause contributes. And then lastly, um, diminished sexual function. Some of this may be due to uh, decreasing testosterone and sort of a threshold effect. But the other thing we know, like how many of you have had a, been with the same partner for the past 30 years or more? Um, newness in sexual activity. So the best cure for um, low libido, they say, is having a new girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, there are so many factors that come into play here that are important. And the diminished libido is directly linked to painful sexual activity. So if you have pain, you're not going to be very excited about um, uh, engaging in sexual activity. And if you're sweaty and hot and exhausted, um, libido is going to fall. But there are physical changes that occur uh, due to lower estrogen in the vaginal and vulvar tissues that result in dryness, inflammation of the opening of the bladder or the urethral meatus, painful urination, urinary frequency, recurrent urinary tract infections. So in summary, what are these, what are these physiologic changes? Well, if you think about it, every system, every tissue can be affected. The hormone receptors for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone are ubiquitous throughout our bodies. And so no wonder um, we are sometimes surprised and not so happy by some of the changes that we're experiencing. It's a dynamic, not a fixed model. And the greatest of change, changes occur in the two years before and the two years after the final menstrual period. So I wanted to just take us then uh, from this sort of background of, of what people are experiencing to what do we know about um, how much is aging and how much is hormones. And again, I've, I've um, come to SWAN. I've, uh, you see the figure on the right-hand side here walks us through uh, midlife aging in the blue. So that, these are felt to be aging processes. And then the orange uh, or peach color is, is depicting things that are associated with the menopause transition. Some of these things are both. And so uh, what you'll see here, the depression and anxiety here at the top, this does occur in the uh, late menopause transition for sure. It is transient though, as related to your hormonal changes. Aging uh, related increasing depression and anxiety is not necessarily transient. Incontinence increases with aging. So trying to tease that apart from menopause is really challenging. In fact, women who are given hormone uh, therapy can have worsening urinary incontinence. So it's not all about the estrogen. We talked about cognitive uh, performance uh, decreasing and, and this is not transient, it's a trajectory and there are a number of things we do to, to help with this. Hot flashes, as we talked about, tend to be transient. Sleep complaints that worsen, um, I would have, uh, I, I like to see this in the peach color, but certainly sleep does become problematic as we age. This is fabulous. See the transient on the uh, cognitive uh, difficulties, increasing cognitive difficult difficulties. It goes away when it's related to menopause. If it's not going away as you get through the transition, you need to think about other causes there. Vaginal dryness is progressive. It doesn't happen right around the transition and then go away. It, it gets worse and worse and worse unless uh, treated. And we can talk about uh, potential treatments for this. 
Increasing sexual pain and decreased desire, again here, um, not transient. These are things we need to work about on and talk about treatments. Physical function performance, transient, so like the frozen shoulders, these do go away, but we really have to work on this last thing here, decreased lean muscle mass and increased fat mass. We've got to change our exercise regime to help us with that. Your cholesterol and your blood vessels are changing and you have an increased risk for a condition called metabolic uh, syndrome that starts and accelerates with the menopause transition. As we age, our body mass index increases, our blood pressure increases, but these things are also accelerated with the menopause transition. And I love Swan says, this is a window of opportunity. Just uh, the whole content of this webinar is around awareness, new healthy behaviors, and design early preventive practices. So this is where we wanna go with this. And this is the summary of that here on the left-hand part of this slide. Talk to your provider if you have bothersome symptoms, don't hesitate. Ask questions about hormonal and non-hormonal manage management options. Think about what, which one you might prefer. You wanna increase your weight bearing exercise. You wanna get some hand weights so you really work on your arms. There's a fracture called collie fracture that is right here on the wrist. And women typically will fall with their hand outstretched. So having strengthening in your hands is really important. It, some women in the Pacific Northwest will have low vitamin D and low vitamin D will give you fatigue. Um, it will cause you to have a low mood and it is not good for your bones or your muscle strength. So uh, it is a good time to check in with your provider and make sure you have adequate vitamin D. You wanna do balance training, increase your core strength. So yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi. And this is the sad, another sad part of my talk, I'm sorry to say. So I used to have a nice big dinner plate, right? So I've moved to the salad plate for my dinners as best I can because you cannot take in the same calories that you did prior to menopause and feel good and stay healthy. You wanna think about what you're taking in, increase your fruits and vegetables, uh, lean proteins, really important. Bone density scan or DEXA scans are recommended for a, at age 65 and older, but you would need one sooner if you have risks for fracture or uh, things that have occurred in your lifetime that put you at risk for uh, fracture, such as decreased calcium absorption or time in your life where you had no periods at all because you were really slender. I wanted to highlight, um, we have used a lot of pills for sleep problems historically in our society. And our group uh, did a wonderful randomized control trial looking at cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia in women in and the menopause, uh, these were postmenopausal women. And the findings were astounding. It worked really, really, really well. This was an intervention that we did over the phone. And uh, there's a lot that we can um, do here beyond pills. Uh, I can't uh, stress this enough. If you have mood changes, don't ignore them. They're real. They may well be related to your hormones, but do seek care from your provider. The incontinence I mentioned, uh, often related to aging, but ask for treatment. Uh, it is not okay to have this problem. There's so many things we can do for you. So seek care. And the same goes for pain with sex or vaginal dryness. Um, this leads, I think I'm going to, we'll do a few more things, but I'm going to, one of the questions from the survey was, my provider doesn't quite get this. What do I do? And we're going to talk some more about what web resources you have and, and where you're going to go to help with, uh, really getting a program of uh, prevention and wellness going. So here I've answered the question here. My pop quizzes are really boring, I'm sorry. Um, what is the most effective therapy for hot flashes? Today, it still remains estrogen and progesterone for women with a uterus and for women without a uterus, it's estrogen alone. Uh, I got a question from someone who was taking black cohosh and she said that it was helping her. Our group did do a randomized control trial where we compared black cohosh placebo 
a multi botanical that had black cohosh and a number of other herbs. And then we had a, another group that had uh, the multi botanical plus a soy diet. And unfortunately, what our randomized trial showed over a year that the black cohosh did not work uh, for our population of women that were in our trial. And the thing that worked the most was our estrogen compound. So the black host was just the same as placebo. Now, what I know as a trialist, and those, if there's anybody else in the audience that does uh, trials, placebo is a big deal. And so if you get a, the placebo effect for menopause trials is around uh, 33%. And, and if you get a placebo effect, it's great. It's all good. And you haven't hurt yourself with, um, with taking perhaps an estrogen or progesterone. So this is an interesting one. And here I give you the answer here. When in your life are you at the highest absolute risk? And so absolute risk means the um, not a risk relative to any other group, but the exact risk for you as an individual. What is your highest absolute risk of problems that would be associated with any hormone exposure? So age 30 and pregnant. Well, if you actually look at the, the relative risk, your relative risk of side effects from hormones is actually when you're 30 and pregnant. And this is our way of comparing uh, groups and making them all uh, com comparable. And the reason for this, as I mentioned earlier, your estradiol serum levels when you're pregnant are around 20,000. And postmenopausal, your estradiol serum levels are 20. So you add a, a formulation, a postmenopausal hormone formulation on top of that, you might get to about 50, but it, it's the estrogen that gives you leg clots, possible stroke, and, and problems with your heart, uh, et cetera, that we see sometimes in pregnancy. Well, um, age 63, taking postmenopausal estrogen and progesterone, this slide has an error on it, and this should be estrogen alone. So your risks when you are taking estrogen and progesterone from the side effects of hormone are greater than the risks when you take estrogen alone. Let's talk a little bit more about this. So this is a slide that shows you age 30 not pregnant, age 30 pregnant, or age 30 with birth control pills and age 30 pregnant. And what you can see is the only age 30s that get even a little blip are our pregnant women here for heart attack, stroke, uh, lung leg clots, and uh, breast cancer. So it's actually your highest relative, or sorry, this is absolute risk. And, and so uh, then let's go to the age 53. And what we're seeing here in the peach if the women that aren't taking hormones have a lower risk across the board than those that are taking hormones. And you can see that here. And again, these are absolute risks. Lastly, when you're age 63 and you're taking no hormones at all, so that's this red bar, you're still at higher risk than these 50 somethings for an, a, a higher absolute risk of an untoward heart attack, stroke, leg clot, or, or breast cancer. And then the worst thing you can do is be age 63 and take an estrogen and a progesterone. Um, it's all about the perspective, I think, when you start to think about how you're going to manage your um, problems. Now, if you look at these absolute risks, this is per 10,000, right? And so let's go to, say, uh, stroke. It's going to be uh, taking hormones, age 53, around 20 per 10,000. So at most, two per thousand is going to be your risk for a stroke. Nobody wants a stroke. So um, how do you manage that and think about that? Um, I'm going to close here with some of the things we want to think about and do uh, to help keep ourselves healthy. The first is to exercise and maintain normal body weight. So important. This is, uh, you know, some people would say never cross the street in downtown Seattle. Your risks uh, here, crossing the street in downtown Seattle, are worse than taking a hormone. So things are relative, right? 
chance of getting hit by lightning is almost more than uh, dying from hormones. It's, things are relative. But if you had to put things in order, it's exercise and normal body weight. You're seeing a theme here in this talk. We know, and this is backed by epidemiologic data, that on the whole, Asian cultures or Asian women tend to have fewer hot flashes, less heart disease, less breast cancer, less endometrial cancer, fewer fractures, and less osteoporosis. They eat better, they maintain a normal body weight, and they um, have fewer overall risks in general. So these are some of the core um, body strengthening things I'm gonna encourage everybody to do um, are gonna be so important uh, once you have that final menstrual period. So can we do a quick hand count? Who wants to do menopause really quick or do you wanna move into answering your questions? And I'm gonna rely on Yasmin to give me directions on which way the group wants to go. So the thumbs up, is this for menopause? Let's, so let's do thumbs up for menopause. I, and if that's a moment to scroll through, uh, we have, I think, quite a few dozen people. So I'm just scrolling through the view then, to get an idea. Yeah, it's, it's a lot to do. Okay, I got a general idea there. Is it 50-50 and then answer questions? Thumbs up, answer your survey, question, survey questions. I think Susan, I'm looking at the chat and watching hands and I yeah. think that overwhelmingly people would love you to answer questions. And okay, there are so probably more than we'll be able to get to even if we jump right in. Okay, so that's really helpful. Let me see if I can get myself organized here then. I'm gonna bring this down for a second. And uh, okay, ready to go. I'm gonna bring this over. So I'm kind of looking at you and bring my questions in. I'm gonna stop my screen share if that's okay. Oh, and then you've moved again. I love that, you know, how many screens can we have, right? Okay, so one of the, the uh, key things that came up was what if I've had a hysterectomy? What if I'm on birth control pills? What if I have the Marina IUD? How do I know what's happening for uh, when I'm in menopause? So women that don't have a uterus but still have ovaries are not menopausal until their ovarian function uh, diminishes. And you have to do lab tests for that. So you'll do an FSH and an estradiol. Same thing would be true if you've got a Marina IUD because the IUD does not, you are often not having periods or they're irregular. If you have symptoms and you're in the normal age group for having uh, menopausal symptoms, then I often don't do lab tests. They're not that helpful. There's not much else this can be. If you're on birth control pills, you are not gonna have menopausal symptoms and you usually don't have changes in your periods because the birth control pill has estrogen in it and it's uh, helping you not have symptoms. Um, how do we find care when symptoms are so diffuse and lab work is often within normal ranges? So it doesn't matter what your labs are. If you were in the right age group, because what happens is the hormones go way up and they go way down. They go up and down like a roller coaster. And if you happen to get checked on the day that your hormones are in a normal range, they're gonna show normal and your provider will say, oh, you're not menopausal. Not true. If you have irregular periods and you have symptoms, that's the menopause transition. Um, I love this comment. I definitely don't feel normal, but even my most sympathetic and engaged doctors don't seem to really struggle to help me tease out perimenopausal issues, especially since I started experiencing them in my late 30s. So some women can get them at earlier ages. I just uh, covered how does a birth control pill affect the menopause transition. If you want to find out if you're in menopause, so usually what I do is starting uh, in the late 40s, sort of around age 48, you want to test the FSH 
and the estradiol on the week off of your periods, on the seventh day off of the period to get a sense of what's happening. And you're gonna probably need to do that a couple of times. So it may mean a couple of uh, blood draws, draws. If you're not using birth control pills for contraception, I will drop my patients to a lower dose formulation that gives them the relief release relief from their symptoms, manages their periods, but isn't such a high dose that they could have um, a bad side effect, such as a leg clot. Um, what can people accept, expect when they have a progesterone IUD? Um, some women with a progesterone IUD have lighter symptoms. So what's really nice is you're not having those horrible heavy periods and will often use this in the late 40s to help manage irregular periods or heavy bleeding. Um, but it does make it challenging to know when, when is that final menstrual period? When was menopause for you? You may never truly know. We do check hormones. Here's a question. Does perimenopause explain sudden and drastic decrease in menstrual flow at age 38, or might there be a signal of early onset menopause? That um, is not perimenopause because the definition of perimenopause starts at age 40. So you're 40 and above for perimenopause. If you experience hot flashes or change in your periods before age 40, you should see your provider. When, sh when should one be concerned about heavy bleeding in the middle of a cycle? And this was well on a pill. Well, what's happening there is your estrogen is just completely overriding that period. See your provider, there may be some other medications you're wanting to use. Uh, when can women start using medication to re reduce or prevent symptoms? When they become bothersome for you. So each one of you out there, all of you glorious women out there are gonna be different. Don't do what your sister or your mother or your girlfriend does. Go in and see your provider. And when you your quality of life is affected, you need to see your provider to have a conversation about how they can help you. What natural supplements have women uh, you treated found most helpful to address hot flashes and also brain fog and mood swings? Natural supplements are uh, challenging. There's not a lot of data here. Um, what we do know is sleep helps tremendously. So if you're having sleep problems, getting the rest you need is gonna be really important. And I mentioned the cognitive behavioral therapy. Some women use melatonin and there are some other medications that sometimes are needed. And then some women say, I just need to take hormones. I cannot sleep, I'm sweating, I need help. And we have a good conversation about risks and benefits. And for women age 50 to 59, this is a relatively safe um, choice. Thoughts about bioidentical hormones. Well, bioidentical hormone means a hormone that's exactly like the hormone you make uh, from your ovaries or your adrenal glands. And there are compounding pharmacies that make these, but there are also FDA approved bioidentical hormones. Estradiol in pill and patch form is a bioidentical hormone it's the same estradiol you make yourself. So almost all of my patients would be on uh, an FDA approved formulation rather than a compounded uh, pharmacy. Micronized progesterone is a bioidentical hormone. And so that's an FDA approved product, I use that. Why do I do that? Well, the FDA came to us for a reason. Compounding pharmacies are not mandated to make sure that what's on the label is truly in that product. And the FDA is mandated to regulate that and be sure that whatever's on that label is within 20% of the dose of what it says it is. It doesn't have any metals, it doesn't have any bacteria. Um, so it's for safety reasons, I tend to go with the FDA products. Sometimes there are not FDA products. Uh, for example, there is nothing for women uh, for testosterone and some of my patients uh, are on testosterone. That's unusual. Um, but again, usually I would use an FDA approved formulation that's for a man and we dilute it uh, one to 10. Uh, how can perimenopausal symptoms be managed without medications? Well, there's some great um, tools, layers, layers, layers. So tank top, 
long sleeve uh, sweater and then maybe a jacket and you are gonna pull things off and on. Um, person in my office has a fan. Uh, there are fans that go beneath the bed sheets. There are some nice scarves that you can put in your freezer that have a cooling element in the back of that that can go around your neck. Um, behavioral therapy. So the same way that uh, anyone who may have uh, a mood disorder have panic or anxiety disorder, we learn to modify our experience through cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and by telling yourself, okay, I know I have a hot flash, it's not gonna kill me, kind of talking yourself off the cliff has been shown to be helpful. If it's not helping, you gotta go to the, the next level. Um, what are the best ways to take care of our bodies? I think I answered that, exercise, et cetera. Uh, does exercise help the estrogen level? Well, this is a great one. Our group also did a randomized control trial where we uh, randomized women with hot flashes to exercise. They came into the gym. We had a regimented um, uh, protocol and we compared that to women who were not exercising and we did not see a decrease in hot flashes. We did see an improvement in quality of life. We saw an improvement in physical strength. These things matter. Um, so exercise is great for you, but it is not gonna decrease the number of hot flashes you have. Um, anything you can share about strength and muscle mass changes? Um, I find more and more difficult to stop weight gain. And uh, I was told I was perimenopausal at age 40. I'm now in my 50s and have not hit menopause yet. So. This is what we were talking about, that duration. I gave you median duration, sometimes up to 11 years. This uh, nice person who is probably on the webinar out there is in the tail of a normal curve. And uh, it, it makes it rough. I would seek a provider who really understands health and wellness for midlife women who can uh, give you more tips on uh, moving forward and helping yourself uh, feel healthy. Special population. So how might this experience be different for women who have never had children? Not necessarily different to our knowledge. Um, do any symptoms of perimenopause change if a person is at higher risk for endometrial or ovarian cancer due to genetics? Not necessarily, so symptoms don't change, but your choices for treatment are maybe different than someone else that doesn't have these risks. Is there anything special to watch out for or pay attention to, but not panic uh, about to avoid unnecessary testing? Find a good provider who understands uh, your genetic risks and understands menopause, uh, I guess is my best answer there. Um, and, and I love this comment. I just have to read it. Do you have any encouraging words about this stage? It is exhausting. So could we all, we can almost all do a hand wave around that one, right? How many just feel so beat down by uh, this time in your life? It is absolutely exhausting. My only words of our encouragement are, see all the women on this webinar with you. We're all here together. We're all learning about this, thinking about this, and coming together as a group to problem solve um, how we're going to stay healthy and well through this. So we're going to support each other. It does end. So the other thing I would say, I can't tell you how many patients I now have who are older who say, I'm so glad not to have a period. I'm glad not to have to worry about becoming pregnant. The hot flashes did end. I, there's a freedom that I feel um, that is really exhilarating. So for not all women are bothered by this time in their lives. Um, and it's, it is often perspective and support um, that helps get you through. Um, medical staff referred to timing, cessation of menstruation, but I've always struggled to have regular periods. So this is an individual who may have uh, PCOS or another reason for irregular periods. And so the rules change for you. Um, and you're not, you, 
you need special uh, thought and consideration around what will the transition be for you. And that's a, a, a different conversation. What are the best locations? So um, I'm wondering if, um, Yasmin, I think you have my slides. Do you mind bringing them up? And at the end, I just have some references for people. Um, if you could do that while I keep answering questions, that would be awesome. I will pull them up. Great. Um, Susan, there's been a, a couple of questions yeah. in the chat that um, I think you've touched on most of them. Okay. Um, there's one, one question fairly straightforward about is a hot flash really defined by like sweating, getting hot and sweaty, or is it really just feeling hot all over? Like how to know what is a hot flash? Yeah, it can be a glow. It can be just this, this, and, and I like to say, think of it as a glow. Cause that's a, that's a, a happier kind of word than a hot flash is kind of miserable. So it, it's a huge range constellation and it's different woman to woman. Yeah. Right. Someone asked about hair thinning. Um, it wasn't a symptom that you mentioned, but can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, unfortunately it's part of aging, but it is also part of lower estrogen. And there are dermatologists out there who specialize in hair loss at this time in your life. Anytime, so those of you that have been pregnant or started a birth control pill or um, certain times in your life that you had a big hormonal change, your hair is going to fall out. Your hair gets reset every seven years, but a change in hormones is going to reset your clock. And uh, a change in your hair at this time is almost a given. Almost all women find a new uh, good place though. So your hair does, uh, after it's fallen out, it grows back. Um, and there are good um, providers that can help with this. Susan, sorry to jump in here. Which slide um, did you want uh, me to pull up? It's the one that has, uh, I think, the um, Space Needle and Thank Yous, and then it has uh, WHI, SWAN, NAMS. You, you find it is kind of in the middle after the know. after the menopause. After the menopause. Other questions, Kathleen? While she's pulling that. Yeah, I will say um, just for everyone who's in attendance, I know there's been a lot of questions about sleep, both that came up in the survey questions and today, and it's it's making me think about collaborating with the whole you and maybe doing a, a focus session on sleep oh, and yeah. some, of the, some of the tools. So I just want to kind of bracket that. Um, Someone did ask, you know, given that more women tend to have dementia than men, is there any research related to sleep problems during menopause that is correlated with dementia later in life? Boy, that's a great question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. Dementia and sleep. Um, I'd have to say I heard recently that environmental noise is associated with dementia. So that, you know, so complex. Um, yeah, I think someone else, I'll, I'll just make a couple of observations and you can respond to them um, if you'd like. One, a couple of folks have observed a lot of what you've described in terms of symptoms are things that we're hearing about as symptoms around just the state of the world right now, like being in this kind of hyper aroused state um, around COVID and changes at work and social injustice and unrest. And so, you know, I think there's a question of how to differentiate, you know, what is, what is my developmental change from that? And also how it's compounding and what that might mean for how we care for ourselves. Oh, I, I have to say, I was just trying to pull up this uh, slide and I wasn't listening as carefully as I had. So COVID and how this has yeah, just, just the, you know, a lot, a lot of the things you told us to do to take care of ourselves yeah. are yeah. things we're hearing in general, and they're things that are really hard for a lot of people to do right now. <laughs> um, they anyway. are. And so how do we, how do we support each other and help each other um, through this? I really do think it does become um, more of, there's that uh, slide there. It, it does get back to um, caring for each other as best we can. Um, during COVID, 
reaching out to that neighbor or that person down the hallway in your apartment building who might be lonely um, and need some help, some support, acknowledging the challenges that we're all having and going through. Certainly um, stress from COVID has brought more women into my office. So on one of my earlier slides, you saw stress increases your hot flashes. Um, so ways that we can help decrease our stress by coming together as a society and community are really what we're looking for there. I'm not sure, I hope I answered that. Can you all see this now? The resources, is it up for you? Yes. Kathy? Yes, okay. So I wanna point out the North American Menopause uh, Society website. This is a good one. The website, uh, true disclosures, I'm president elect for the North American Menopause Society. Nancy Woods, who I mentioned already is a past president. This uh, website, although currently uh, uh, a little, it's being redone. If you go into the website, look for the area under patients. Um, there are some good documents there that can be helpful as far as information. You can also find a provider there. So you can go onto that website, plug in your uh, zip code, and it will tell you those providers who are um, certified menopause providers through the North American Menopause Society. That means they've taken an exam. They have an ongoing practice uh, for patients and have a better understanding about how to care for you. So if you're struggling to find a provider, that's a good place to go. I mentioned the Women's Health Initiative, um, and this is their website. They have some materials that are helpful. Our group uh, that, again, Dr. Woods was a part of uh, this group is called Ms. Ms. Flash. We did randomized controlled trials that uh, evaluated uh, predominantly non-hormonal therapies, and we would compare to what's known with estrogen in a couple of our, our studies. Um, and then lastly, the SWAN reference that uh, I brought up in the early part of the talks that really tell, tell us the most about um, what are the physiologic changes that happen through the transition. And uh, I see a typo there, so I'm gonna fix that right now. Here's my uh, email. I welcome emails uh, from any and all of you. And if some of your questions uh, are, are leading into more than we might be able to do through an email, I'll encourage you to make an appointment and send you that information. Um, it's really been my pleasure to uh, be here today with all of you. And I look forward to a time that we are in person. I love seeing people's faces. I love hearing uh, people's voices. Um, we're efficient with the chat but um, I think we miss community, right? That is so true. And Susan, thank you for helping create community with us today. Um, I have been so delighted by the chat and the information. Um, I do want to acknowledge there were some wonderful comments in the, in the chat that reminded us to be inclusive and in supporting one another. We need to keep expanding our conversation and our language that we have you know, trans colleagues and friends and family members and others who are not in the binary. So thank you to those of you who commented on that. And I think that's something I know I will be mindful of as we continue these conversations. Um, but Susan, thank you. You have done so much in an hour, both to inform us and support us and bring us together in a really wonderful way. And I will follow up with you afterwards to maybe address a couple of the things that came up in the chat we didn't right. get to when we right. sent the slides and the video to everyone. So thank right. you all. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all. Your evaluation when it comes, everyone, and take good care. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Okay. We still have a lot. Are we good? We are. Still, still people yeah. leaving, but yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. I do so welcome the comments on inclusive language. We really have to work on it, um, and and. Uh, it is so, so, so important that we continue to think carefully about, about that language. Yeah. yeah. Susan, I have to say, you, you, you compete in triathlons. You are an amazing endurance athlete. Your ability to cover so much information in a way that is so quick and engaging and thoughtful, like thumbs Welcome. up. Good, um, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. 
It's a rare combination to have that level of speed and efficiency, but also be engaging. So I would like yeah. to plus one what Kathleen said. It was great. Yes. Thank no, thank you so much. And um, I really do think I, I will go through the chat really closely, but yeah. I think you've covered almost everything that came oh, up. There are a couple of things that I think we might not have gotten to, but I think that um, if you're open to it, we will pull those out. And before we send the video and slides to folks, if you do have a couple bullets that you're willing to make time to add, we'll share them with folks. Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds great. All right. And I may follow up with you separately about who on your research team might be great for us to work with on doing a session on sleep. And especially, I think the CBT approach to sleep that you described was fascinating. Um, so it's, yeah, it's referral Sue is wonderful. It's Sue McCurry, who's in nursing. Okay, Sue, oh, the last Sue name is McCurry. I have, oh, I've got worked, her email, yep. I, I worked with Sue, yeah, I worked, Sue did a webinar with me last spring, actually. She's so I will awesome. follow up with her. She's awesome. And I am, I am on the trail of somebody else. Uh, so if I get that other name, I'll send it to you. That is great. Well, great. you've okay. already been so generous with your prep time, your time together. So we will let you go. I'm going to jump off because I have another meeting at four. So I better go. Perfect. Right. Great. So, Thanks. Bye, right. Susan. Take a care. Bye. Everyone else who is still on, we're going to close down. Um, yeah, so thank you for being with us and we'll look for you at another event soon. Bye-bye.